Hey, what's up everyone? Thanks for joining me. In this video, what we are taking a look at is performing a volt drop calculation, specifically using table D3 from the 2018 Canadian Electrical Code. So we are going to start uh, looking at our situation here. What we have is we have our 122 40 volt panel that supplies our 83 amp load. Some specifics to this, we have our 240 volt single phase load with 75 degree terminations. It is a non-continuous load, so we're not going to be performing any kind of branch circuit continuous calculations. Um, and it is fed with a one aught gauge conductor, and the conductor is RW90XLPE unjacketed. So just some specifics to the question. Uh, when we're dealing with this specifically, what we are taking into account here is we want to determine how far can we go given the information that we have in the question here, right? So again, we have that one aught gauge conductor feeding an 83 amp load uh, with a 240 volt supply. So the first place that we want to take a look at is 8-102, which tells me that my branch circuit is allowed up to a 3% volt drop. Okay, so first we need to determine what is the branch circuit. Well, according to section zero definitions, basically from that final overcurrent device to that point of utilization, that would be considered my branch circuit, right? So in that case, basically from there all the way to there, we are allowed a 3% volt drop. We're not going to calculate what that is, but essentially it would be what is 3% of 240 volts. That's how much voltage we could drop before we get to the load, uh, before it starts to cause problems. So now that we've determined that we're going to go with a 3% volt drop, let's take a look at table D3. So a couple of things that we need to remember when dealing with table D3, D3 is based off of a few factors, right? First of all, table D3, so we'll write table D3 is based off of a 1% volt drop, 120 volts, and a two wire uh, branch circuit for that, right? So um, obviously things are going to affect that. So as I go forwards with, um, you know, larger voltages, larger percent allowable voltage drops, it's going to allow us to go further and further. So in this example, particularly, um, we're going to build our formula based off of all of this information. That's how anytime I do a volt drop calculation, that's how I start as I build the exact same formula every time. It's tried and true. It works every time. Okay, so we're going to build our formula. Let's switch colors here. So we're going to say we want to know what is the maximum distance? Okay, so the maximum distance, if I was working with a 120 volt circuit, 1% volt drop, I could just go right to table D3, and this would be essentially a direct lookup. Now to use table D3, what we're going to do is we're going to go down the column where it says current, and we're going to find our load. Unfortunately, there is no 83 amp load, and what it tells me in table D3 in the notes, is specifically note 8, is that for currents intermediate to listed values, use the next highest current value. So there is no 83 amp load, so we're going to go up to the, the, uh, the 100 amp row. And we're going to take that 100 amp row, and we're going to follow it all the way over until we land on that one aught column. Okay, and it tells me maximum, maximum distance is equal to my D3 value which in this case, we're going to switch that. We're going to go to D3 value tells me I'm allowed to go up to 15.8 meters. Okay, so under these circumstances, I would be allowed to go 15.8 meters with my one aught conductor. However, we do have a higher voltage and a higher percent volt drop. So that's how we're going to build our formula. So my formula goes my D3 value multiplied by the ratio of my actual voltage divided by 120 volts, that is what table D3 is based off of, right? And then we're going to multiply it by the actual percent volt drop divided by 1% volt drop, because again, that is what table D3 is built off of. And then we're going to multiply it by this thing called a distance correction factor, which we'll talk about in a second here. But let's just call it our DCF, okay? This is going to tell me what is the actual maximum distance I can go based off these other factors, right? So in this case, we're going to substitute some values for variables here. We're going to say that we actually have 240 volts compared to the 120 volts that it's based off of. And we're actually allowed to go up to a maximum of 3% volt drop. So we'll put that in there, 3% compared to 1%. All right, and then we'll multiply by that DCF. 
We'll come back to this DCF and we'll erase that and punch in an actual number once we figure out what that DCF is all about. Okay, so um, let's talk about the distance correction factor. Okay, so distance correction factor is essentially this. If you're reading in the notes on table D3, the distance correction factor, all these numbers, all this tabulated data that we have is based off the fact that the conductor is held at essentially 60 degrees Celsius. And at 60 degrees Celsius, these are the distances that we could go. If we go to note three in table D3, what we notice as we start to load, it says the percentage of allowable ampacity. Now the percentage of allowable ampacity, that's basically saying, well, we have an 83 amp load and we're supplying it with a one aught conductor. Now, normally we know a one aught conductor is good for way more than 83 amps. So based on that, we can actually squeak a little bit extra distance uh, out of this conductor now. So we know D3 value is 15.8 meters, but we might be able to go even a little bit further based off of the fact that, again, we, uh, we're not fully loading this thing. So distance correction factor looks like this. We're going to take the load, the actual load, what we're supplying, and we're going to divide it by the allowable ampacity of our conductor. Right, so the allowable ampacity of our conductor is going to be based off of a couple of factors. We know we're going to go to tables 1, 2, 3, or 4 to find the ampacity of that one aught conductor. And in this particular example, it's an RW90XLPE, that's fine. But really what we're looking at is there's no more than three conductors in a conduit. Right, It is in a conduit. There's nothing telling us that we have an ambient temperature higher than 30 degrees. So we know for sure that we can go with our table 2. Okay? Now that we've determined that we're going to go to table 2, now we need to figure out what is the temperature column that we're going to use. Well, 4006 sub row 1 tells me that if we have a temperature listed, so 75 degrees here, 75 degrees here, even though we have a 90 degree insulation, that almost doesn't matter at this point because we're going to go with that lowest termination temperature, which in this case, that's where we're going to use that table 2 in the 75 degree column. So that's where we're going to pull the ampacity of the actual conductor. So the load in this case we know is 83 amps, and we're comparing it to the 150 amps allowable ampacity based off table 2, 75 degree column. And once we've got that number, we have 83 amps, we take that, divide it by our 150, and that gives us a number around 0.553. Or really what we're saying is we're loading this conductor up to about 55.3% of its allowable ampacity. Now, with that percentage, what we're going to do is go to note 3 in table D3. And we want to take a look at, specifically note 3, before the table it specifies that if the percentage doesn't correspond with what we've calculated, we're going to go up to the next percentage, right? So 55.3, we're not going to go down to 50, we're going to go to that 60% column. And if we go down, it also says in note 3, and this is the part where we specifically have to pay attention to what we're doing, uh, when we go to note three, use the insulation temperature. Okay, specifically the insulation temperature, and I'm gonna put under there only, right? Because when we found that 150 amps based off the 75 degree termination temperature, that's different. What we're doing now is taking the actual insulation temperature to table D3, note three, and that's where we're going with the corresponding column, right? So we're going to go to the 85 to 90 degree column, sorry, row rather, not column. And if we cross-reference that 85 to 90 degree row to the 60% column, it gives us a distance correction factor of 1.04. Okay, and that's where that number is going to go. We're going to punch that right in here. We're going to erase that DCF and let's put that 1.04 right in there. Okay, so what we're actually looking at is, I'm just going to write it out again, 15.8 meters times 240 over 120 times 3 over 1 times 1.04. There's our distance correction factor that we obtained, and we should end up with a number around 98.52 meters. So, had this have just been a 120 volt circuit with a 1% volt drop, that's where we would have seen this 15.8 meters come in. I would have been allowed to go 15.8 meters, but again, because we're using 240 volts, 
and a 3% volt drop, and because I can squeak a little bit more out because of that one, that uh, distance correction factor, we actually end up with an answer of around 98.52 meters. Okay, so in the next video, what we're going to take a look at, so in this video specifically, we took a conductor that we were given and determined how far away could we go with a given load. In the next video, what we're going to take a look at is what size conductor is required for that same load located a given distance away from the panel. Thanks for joining me.